Yeah, I think one of the things that really personally when um, I decided to do some of these interviews is, I think it was a few weeks ago, there was a nurse out of, um, I want to say South, South Dakota, and she was being uh, interviewed. Of, I think they picked up on a, some tweets that she had put out, but um, mm-hmm. she was just discussing uh, both in her tweets, but also in these interviews she did, I think on CNN and a few other places, but she was just explaining this strange phenomenon of having people um, dying from COVID and, you know, in the hospital beds and ICUs that she's in and people just can't, it doesn't sink in even when they're dying from this disease. They just, they can't, it it just goes up against everything that they believed up to that point. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, there's only so much people can do when you do trust in science and you do understand what's happening. And, and even just on this very personal level, this anecdotal, like you're expressing what you're experiencing. And -hmm. there's so many other people I know that have experienced this as well. And it's still, there's still so many people that just aren't taking the proper precautions. And I don't know what else we can possibly do except just to communicate the information and hope that maybe there's some point, and it's really tragic, but that there's some almost some point where it really does sink in collectively um, to where we actually just listen to like nurses and doctors and healthcare workers and regards to how to deal with this crisis it's just it's very it's upsetting and i'm just sitting outside of it you know i've been doing my part somewhat to stay away and um trying to isolate myself and try to protect those around me um but it's just really heartbreaking to just see so many people that are being impacted by this this virus and especially just to see healthcare workers like yourself that are like you're bearing the brunt of the work and I just had to just articulate that to you just because that that's where I'm coming from. It's just really mm-hmm. difficult to see this happening. Um, yeah, I just want to, I guess, ask, like, how are you doing? I mean, how is how are your fellow nurses and doctors like like uh, maybe on a more personal level? I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but just like, well, I'll talk about all of it. You know, yeah. it's I'm an open book for this subject. Okay. It's um, I think one word I can use to describe is I'm just mad. Mm -hmm. I'm mad at this, that how long it's taken, that people are still not paying attention. Um, um, There's still fear in me. Like, you know, I'm, I'm a, we, as healthcare workers, we're under the microscope in health too. You know, it's, I have several family members are for masks, several who are against and that puts me in a very difficult position too. I mean, they're going to believe what they want. There's no way I'm going to change that, but that's not going to stop me from promoting it, um, promoting, you know, self-isolation and, and it's hard because I'm such a social person too. And thank goodness I get to go to work every day and I (laughs) get to be in that camaraderie of people who know what we're going through. I have several burnout buddies that, (laughs) You know, yeah. we're able to talk about people who, who, you know, you talk to some people and they're like, oh, you're great. You're amazing. I can't believe what you do. But it's not that. I, I, it's, yeah, yeah, it was rough. We barely got through the day. You know, it's, um, some of us are kind of disgusted with the term healthcare heroes because mm. yeah, it doesn't feel that way. We don't always feel like, I mean, we did the best that we could some days, but Um, at the end of the day, I know that it wasn't the job that I could have done prior. Do you know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I did my best, but was it my best because of, because of the weight that we have on us there Yeah, and with patients being in isolation and not being able to have that family advocate there with them every day, that's a lot more on our backs that we have to advocate for this mm-hmm. patient, we're in their room, we're passing meds, you know, and a lot of times it's really hard to to build that rapport, that relationship with your patient when you're so stretched. Yeah. So we try to make our time the best as possible, but you know, it it um it's definitely hard. Yeah, is it I imagine there's that sense of camaraderie among your your fellow workers right i mean you're you're kind right. of in the trenches so to speak in this thing right 
there's, you know, we're all sick of it, but it's what it is and it's what we're doing. And, and at the beginning, you know, it's like, Oh, we went to school. Like we're nurses and we're going to save people and we're doctors and we're, we're here in the ICU. And as soon as, you know, we hear about what's happening, it's like watching a big wave come from the East coast here, just Mm -hmm. crashing down like the wave of COVID. That's all I could, how I could explain it. So we do our research. We try to figure out, Oh, what's drop. Let's learn more about droplet precautions, more about virology. And here as we're studying for this stuff, our quench our thirst gets quenched from a fire hose of information Uh, it's just so much is just beating on us every day it's a new thing every day a new policy so it's it's overwhelming on some days and and um but we still go yeah (laughs) we're still there well the thing that comes up for me is is there anything i mean this has been um going on for months now probably since March, I would say. Um, Mm -hmm. In this time, I mean, I'm sure you've had a lot of time to think about it and begin to process what's, what's happening, but is there anything that like that was really surprising or extremely revealing to you about this things that maybe had come to you and, and you're like, like maybe in regards to like how the state or, or the government, the national, you know, the federal government or any of these other institutions have responded to this or how the public has responded. Has there been anything about this that has like surprised you or has been really like revealing to you? Um, I'd say that the support at the, from our community at the beginning of all this was amazing. And we weren't really even the heat of it at that point. Mm-hmm. Like it had just started and then we all got on lockdown, fizzled out for a little bit. And then I saw a good exam, a good example of at the beginning, the amount of COVID and then the fear of COVID. Mm -hmm. And now it's the fear of COVID and COVID. Right. Right. So people like reversed. Yeah. um, So the supportive community, I would say shocked me that it's no longer there as much uh, Mm -hmm. as I feel like it, it was before people were taking it serious and now they're not. Mm. Um, and it, it's not that I don't want people to live in fear of it. I just want them to be respectful of mm-hmm. of everybody. This is our community. This is all we have. If you know our locals are dying off, our businesses aren't going to stay, you know, around and support. I don't know. That's one thing. Hmm. Um, definitely another shocking thing during all of this is actually seeing. Um, how our administration at the hospital deals with this. Mm. Um, It it would not be an easy job. I'm glad that I get to be a bedside nurse during all of this. Mm -hmm. Uh, My mom's also a nurse and she manages a a, a clinical office and she says, oh, I can't do what you do. Well, I couldn't manage, I couldn't imagine managing, you know, 50 plus people who are in fear of coming to work every day and trying to help fill their bucket so they could come. Um, and, and also the government's response to it. I mean, it's, it's to the point, honestly, that I unfortunately have stuck my head in a hole to, to most of the public media because it's, it's too much. And yeah. I have to focus on myself and my patients and, and um, know how to treat them from what I know, because sure. It's all negative out there. Um, I, I can't even be on social media because of mm-hmm. the animosity. It's, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. You mentioned you had family that's for masks and then those are against masks. And I mm-hmm. mean, do you have conversations with those that are against wearing masks? And, and if so, if, what would you say to them or what have you said to them about that? I have. Um, I It's. A lot of it's the, well, you can't tell me what to do kind of right. attitude. Yeah. And and so I've brought up, well, they also tell, so, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just collecting my thoughts here. You're good. So it's the no gun, pro gun. So you want to keep your gun to protect your family, but you won't wear a mask to protect your family. Right. Like that's yeah. kind of a, that's mm-hmm. a right too. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. a right to not to wear the mask, be told what to do, but it's also a re- our right to keep our community safe. Yeah. Yeah. It's just trying to make those connections of, of how, 
I, I think what's so challenging about this pandemic, about viruses in general, is that one, we can't see them, right? Obviously, we can see the impacts sure. and effects of it, but it's often so, it seems like a very abstract threat. And so it's hard to take seriously sometimes. Um, but also just making that connection of like your individual actions or inaction has real potentially detrimental effects on those close to you. Absolutely. And that's something that I think, I mean, I'm just going to say particularly Americans, U.S. Americans tend to have a hard time with. And I know this is another problem in other countries as well. I don't want to just isolate it in the, on people in this country, but that's just, just something that I've observed. It's just this sort of obsession with individual rights and not really thinking it's about... America. You yeah. can't take away my right. Yeah, yeah. And it's like... Mm -hmm. Actually, part of what I think of as, as actual freedom or, you know, protecting your freedoms is, is based in responsibility and having mm -hmm. responsibility for other people's well-being and health by just following really basic scientific guidelines, medical guidelines, you know. Right. It's why we have speed limits. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's why, I don't know, if one thing, COVID's been a humbling, a humbling wake-up call mm -hmm. as an ICU nurse. Mm -hmm. Um Mm -hmm. It gives me more time. It has taught me to give myself more time to reflect on what matters. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. And it's unfortunate for those families who, who had to go through that, ha who've had to actually go through death of family members to realize that. Yeah. And I hope that, I don't know, you can't always learn from other people's mistakes, but I hope that, you know, our, United States in general will kind of swallow their pride a little bit and wear a mask. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, what do you, I, I know you kind of touched on this a little earlier, but as far as this, what we anticipate is a surge of cases, um, mm -hmm. over the probably next few weeks or months. Um, do you sense like, has there been anything that you can tell is going on in the hospital that you work in as far as preparing for that outcome? Um, Right. We have, we have opened up extra beds in our unit, but I mean, our hospital has been on diversion several times in the last few months to even the last couple of days ago. We're so busy shuffling patients around to make room for more mm -hmm. that I feel sometimes that's a danger to the patients that are already there. Mm -hmm. Um but we have, you know, we have several surrounding hospitals in our community that have volunteered to take um, COVID overflow for us. Um, what I probably, I probably wouldn't be surprised if we'll actually have a, like a, we already have a COVID unit on our floor, like in our hospital, that's already had to overflow into our other, one of our other floors. We have three, a medical floor, a surgical floor, and the cardiopulmonary floor. Um, we've had to overflow some of those COVID patients down to the medical floor. So I wouldn't be surprised if one of our small rural hospitals around us ends up being a COVID, COVID hospitals as well. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're able to roll over some of our patients up to Boise, but we were to the point where, you know, we were full capacity. We can't take any more patients, you yeah. know, yeah. and that's a scary thing to be able to not provide healthcare for somebody in their own town and somehow that gets turned back on us. Like that's our fault, but yeah, people need to take a little bit um, more responsibility in, in their own actions too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is really a, this is, this is really the kind of, I don't want to say worst case scenario, but it's coming up on that, which is what we were scared about from the very beginning of this, which is, mm -hmm. you know, you're talking about diversion, you know, moving, patients to other hospitals or other floors. I mean, at what point will it, like you can't take, you say you can't divert patients to some other hospital because they're overflowing or they're at capacity. Right. And, and, and we have reached know. that. We've reached that point a couple of times. Mm -hmm. um, our neighboring larger hospitals were all full. They weren't able to take any. And our, ne our next patients, we were going to have to start to fly to like Washington. Wow. Yeah. So... <sighs> And that's taxing enough on families to have somebody in the hospital. I couldn't imagine if my grandma had, we were full and my grandma had to go to Wyoming or somewhere, you know? Yeah. No, that would be really like, really, really difficult. Um, mm -hmm. 
and there's just that reality of like that it is a contagious virus and um you know you you can't really visit them in the hospital not really Mm -hmm. when what's the what's the protocol for that actually like if someone's infected we've just barely started opening up for family members to see non-covid patients Mm -hmm. um the hardest the hardest part about covid like you said and we've discussed before is the fact that they're there's no con there's no contact luckily for us when our patients are in critical care i don't know if it's lucky or not but when they're in critical care the the floor of our hospital has large windows family members can come to the window right now not so much it's winter like who's going to sit out there all day for their family member and even at that point there's such a disconnect to having visitors there because they're outside the room they're talking on the phone um I'm a huge advocate for physical touch as a healer and these patients aren't hugging. They're not holding hands. They're not even just the tap on the back handshake from the son or the daughter, you know, the, the wife, the husband patients get lonely. They get tired. They're tired of us telling them what to do every day. Okay. Now I'm going to give you this because this is what's this again. And this is going to make you better poke after poke. They feel terrible and they're alone and there's so many that just give up. They've mm-hmm. gone so long, weeks and weeks, and they give up and it breaks my heart and my heart is tired of that. And yeah, I'm like, F COVID, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's a hell of a thing. And I, you just said that it, it's now they're opening it up to, to, family visitation or, or visitors mm-hmm. can come when they don't have COVID. But I mean, I have a friend who <clears throat> was unable to see their sister, even though they had nothing to do with COVID, they just weren't allowed to visit because of the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Right. And their sister passed away and they were unable to see her before she passed away. And it's just like, imagine all the probably thousands of cases where something similar like that happens, not just with COVID people that are dying from COVID or, or things related to COVID, but just people who just, because of the situation we're all in, we just can't yeah. visit, you know? Um, that's probably one of the most tragic things about this. I mean, I know this is a bit people depressing. Dying, people shouldn't have to die alone ever, ever. Yeah, exactly. Ever. Yeah. And that should be, I mean, I know that I think what's happening is people are so very uncomfortable with, addressing their own mortality and the mortality of those around them. And um, I think that's what's actually created such a panic and a fear in people, which has forced them to almost go in two different, very different directions. For me, is how I look at it. They completely accept it and they're like, okay, let's do what we need to do to protect ourselves and our family and our friends and everything. And then there's the denial, which is what comes up when people are faced with something they can't really like psychologically integrate or understand all right they deny it and they put it away yeah. and then they get angry about it yeah. and then they like kubla ross's stage of grief That's yeah yeah so many people yeah and i just see that happening on this like mass scale and mm-hmm. and i just i don't know i mean if i could reach anybody that's in that place i'm like just look and recognize that you are only on this planet for a certain amount of time and your family's only here for a certain amount of time and the fact is is that if somebody dies right now and is uh, has gets covid right now you can't be with them when they die and if you were to die from it no one would be able to visit you while you were passing away i mean that's got a that's an extremely potent and very mm-hmm. sad thing but it's just the reality of the situation we're in right now and I, I mean i can't imagine that and i know it's very sad and i'm sorry to bring it to this place but it's just it's oh it, it i live it <laughs> yeah you know? exactly i live yeah. it yeah yeah they're they aren't my family members but they're there for so long that you start building relationships with these patients and see the denial that their family goes through and then the anger that their family goes through and then well what if we this and that and then Mm -hmm. then they're all sad and then they finally some hope you know most accept that it is what it is and they help or let their family member go Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. that's you know a whole roller coaster of emotions every day 
every day. Yeah. That's probably, so a, that's it's a... kind of like, how are we going to get through this and what are we going to do to, you know, to keep, mm-hmm. to keep the public, you know, I wish that I could say the stories that happen every day at work. I wish that I could post that, but you know, HIPAA, small <laughs> town community and, yeah. and you, you know, I, I wish that we had a bigger voice and, yeah. and we don't. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we don't stop saying, but the difference between, between, I don't know, the difference between, you know, managing it and coping with it are, are a lot different. Yeah. I think there's this, uh, that's a big part of your job is, is just the kind of the grief, the grief that comes with this sort of profession and, um, and in these sort of extraordinary circumstances that we're in right now, there's, there's a lot of it. And that's a big part of the work that you and other nurses and doctors are doing right now is just carrying the weight of those experiences, you know? Yeah, definitely changes the culture. It definitely changes the culture of, of the hospital and, and we, um, and I just hope that, that we'll gain some sort of strength out of all of this. I mean, I already do feel like we're getting that way. I feel like our teams are stronger now than they were before. Um, the reach to help each other out is a lot better, but, and, and of course our doctor and nurse, uh, responsibilities, I feel like there's a lot more respect on that ground. Um, Mm -hmm. But I just hope that that uh, it continues to be this way, and I'd I'd hate to see any more struggle because we're already stretched pretty thin, and I'd I'd hate to see it have to stretch any further. 